It's Friday night in the A, and you know what that means. Kelly Price and Tori McElhaney coming at you on Rise Up Tonight. Presented by AT&T. I know it is really early on Saturday morning at this point, but let's get the energy up. Let's get hyped because it is Red Helmet Week once again, Tori. Oh, I love it so much. And look, we have the red with the red helmet. I'm in blue for Team USA, of course. Of course. Hopefully we can get another World Cup dub. That'd be nice. Yeah, can't get any better than that. I'm here for that. Well, the Falcons want to get another dub as well. And with the up and down Steelers coming into town, they have an opportunity to bounce back and build back. Let's huddle up about it, y'all. Let's have a look with Kelly and Tori on the world of Falcons football. Y'all know I always want to keep it real around here, and I gotta say that first half Sunday was pretty boring. Tied 10-10 at the half. Neither team was really doing anything splashy. And I say that to say this. The Falcons need more splash plays on both sides of the ball. We've seen them rally around some galvanizing moments in their close wins, and they just didn't capitalize even on the sports, sparse moments that they did have on Sunday. Right, and you make a really good point about capitalizing on those splash plays, and two actually come to, the, to my mind the most from the most recent game. The first being Michael Walker's interception right before the half. Then there was the 44-yard Alameda Zacchaeus explosive catch in the Falcons' final drive of the game. And, well, we all know how that drive ended. I won't belabor the outcome come here, but all of this to say those are two splash moments the Falcons had last week that resulted in actually no points on the board. Yeah, you got to capitalize in those moments. And we now know that Kyle Pitts is officially ruled out for the rest of the year after having a procedure on his knee this week. He's the kind of guy, as Marcus Mariota said, you need multiple people to really step up and replace what he does on this offense. Michael Pruitt, Parker Hesse stepped up, and shout out to all the D-linemen filling in for Taquan Graham as well. Do you think that this team is faring well with all these injuries? Yeah, I've been fairly impressed with what I've seen from Michael Pruitt at tight end and Abdullah Anderson alongside Grady Jarrett within that defensive interior because you're right that you're not going to replace Kyle Pitts or Taquan Graham either with just one person but we've seen both Pruitt and Anderson play quite well for themselves considering that but on top of that if we're just looking at this offense we're actually seeing Cordero Patterson's role as a pass catcher expand just a little bit too in the absence of Kyle Pitts. I think it's really important to remind defenses that this that he can be a vertical threat when he needs to be too. I like to see maybe more of that, maybe even some CP Tyler Algier lining up together with CP moving out wide every now and then. I would like to see that. That would be fun. This week is also huge because the Falcons will be heading into their bye week after Sunday's game, win or lose. And that bye is a lot better when you're basking in the glory of a win, especially knowing when you emerge from that time off, you're still in the thick of a division race if you do win. How much do they really need this win right here and right now? They have to. They have to have it. I mean, there are no ifs and or butts about it you need to beat the Steelers on Sunday period because if you don't the way that you feel about the final seasons look and feel very differently for you Marcus Mariota said after finding out about Tampa Bay's overtime loss to the Browns last week that you want to control your own destiny not wishing for another team to decide it and that's kind of how I feel about where the NFC South stands right now because if the Falcons do what they're supposed to do it'll only help them right and first place in our hearts are the Falcons fits always we are watching Walking in presented by Wells Fargo. First up, Cordero Patterson giving Starburst vibes. That's all <laughs> I can really think of when I see this color combination. But, you know, I love to see a fun fit, especially knowing how nasty it was on Sunday. And I can say I was there, can confirm it was nasty, but this <laughs> fit, not nasty. I mean, even look at those pink cargo type pants. I love it. I love it. Bring in the fun vibes even in dreary weather. Now for Isaiah Oliver, who's in clear agreement with me that not only is it sweater weather, it is leather weather <laughs> as well here. Here's the thing. I mean, don't you think that this kind of looks like the pants version of the leather shorts ensemble that Casey Hayward wore at the beginning of the season. Yes. Yes, I, yes, yes. I think so. I mean, the light blue, the leather, everything. Yeah, we go from shorts to pants here <laughs> in this season as well. There's been some fun in the locker room around college football bets, but let's be real. Lorenzo Carter has the biggest bragging <laughs> rights as the dog in the house. And we know how much uh, wearing red and black means for him, not only in Athens, but now as well. So shout out to Carter for the dapper dog's dirty bird suit here. So as a fellow dog, myself I respect this fit immensely and we've got an SEC championship coming up that I'd imagine Lorenzo will be keeping tabs on he might even be able to go to this one <laughs> well finally I feel like we talk about Grady Jarrett every week here but like I said before we have no choice but to stand a leather fit Look, he could not look any cooler with the custom ice and the fabulous shades. Here's the thing. I think this is the second or third time that Grady has incorporated some type of shades into his fit. And let's be honest, I think they only bring the fit up. Gotta elevate it. And because the glorious red helmets are a 
upon us again. Let's elevate these and get a little commotion for the throwback Got merch that the Falcons have going on. Check this out, guys. You guys can get this on AtlantaFalcons.com, in the team store, in the stadium. I mean, come on. How fresh is this? I mean, don't you just love the, the throwback? I, I will say, I feel like the Falcons have really upped their swag game. I so agree. I agree. And we've been covering that all year. You know, we, we have only we love the hard-hitting stories for you here <laughs> on Rise Up Today. Well, now is normally the time when we air our question of the week. We show you guys a little bit more of the insight into these personalities on the team. But this week, we went even deeper under the surface narrative as Coach likes to call them, asking the Dirty Birds about their hidden talents in our question of the week. My hidden talent, um, I'm a pretty good whistler. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, I save it for my dog. Oh, yeah, he has oh so a, it's like high pitch. Yeah, he has a special whistle oh. that he knows, yeah. I'm very bass level with the piano. I used to play really good growing up in instrument. I played um, uh, saxophone in the band growing up. I don't know a lot of people know, don't know that. And I was a um, all-park basketball player in middle school, so but I can't do nothing. For that. <laughs> so that's my old hit and Berry talent. I guess try to try to score. There's like other things that people don't usually do. I guess. All right, so we'll get Lorenzo Carter to, I guess, whistle while Grady Jarrett plays the sax, yes. and we have a whole jazz band Yeah, I on. didn't know that about Grady. Yeah. I had no idea, but we could also get Dean Pease to play piano. Then Perfect. you basically have a whole band together. Now we have a Christmas concert. <laughs> I'm ready for it. All right, well, coming up later in the show, we're pumped to welcome the queen of Falcons Twitter on the show. Gina Kelly joins us in the nest, and you won't want to miss it. Plus, Grady Jarrett is on a roll giving back this time with a My Cause, My Cleat surprise. That story is coming up next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. Well, in addition to Red Helmet Week, it's also My Cause, My Cleats Week. Victor Prieto has more on a heartwarming surprise for one pair of cleats as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. Writing helps him to just release that emotion and that energy that could be draining at the time. Writing about it, you know, you get to express how you feel. It also helps me while I'm in the hospital, you know, take my mind off of the pain and stuff, so yeah. Keon McNeish was born with sickle cell anemia, a non-curable disease which can cause episodes of severe pain known as crises. It's not easy. It's a lot of emotional turmoil. This last crisis that he had was very scary for him because it limited his mobility. Um, it took him maybe two and a half weeks before he could get back to his regular stride. Sometimes he spent weeks, a long time in the hospital, so you're gonna need like something that's gonna cheer you up. For Keon, he turns to his journal where he writes and draws. Keon is a really good artist, better than me. Falcons defensive tackle Grady Jarrett seems to agree with Ian, choosing design Keon drew while in the hospital to be on his cleats this week during the NFL's annual My Cause, My Cleats initiative. Grady decided to surprise Keon at his house with the news. What's up, Kia? So you appreciate you for you, um, designing my cleats for the game this Sunday. Oh. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> so I'm going to be rocking your design on the field, all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not talked about a lot, you know, so for me, it was important to you know, use my platform to bring awareness to a cause that people, you know, sometimes can look over. To spread awareness about Sick of Cell and have a little bit of his team on the cleats still, so. I designed them with love, <laughs> I would say that. Keon and his family will be able to see Grady wearing his design in person on Sunday when he attends his first ever football game. In Atlanta, Victor Pietro, Fox 5 Sports. It's getting a little dusty in here. I know, that leave one. it to oh. my cause my cleats to get me all misty eyed. Get you in the feels. Yeah. Great story there, Victor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, the Falcons squandered a chance at taking over sole possession of the NFC South, getting back to 500 as well. And I was nodding my head in agreement so hard at your notebook this week that I almost <laughs> gave myself some whiplash. You wrote, at what point does unfortunate become unacceptable? And that's exactly where I need to see this team take another step as well. Yes, exactly. And I know we have this clip coming up that we're about to play, but it really stemmed from a 
quote by Tyler Algier that planted this seed in my head where he's talking about how good teams are competitive, but great teams finish. Mm. And I wrote this and I'll say it here. <laughs> Good teams have unfortunate things happen to them. Great teams consider those unfortunate circumstances unacceptable, and they don't let them happen again, if we're being honest. There have been too many unfortunate moments for the Falcons this year. Don't believe me? Just go read the story on AtlantaFalcons.com. That is so true, and let's take a listen to that insight you alluded to from Tyler Algier after Sunday's loss. It's so insane, especially like a rookie coming in. It's just... It's so insane. It's just um, like we're, we are a good team, but in order to be a great team, just need to finish. But like good, good teams all over, but then just the ones that end up just finishing, like whoever wants it more and stuff. But I think all of our effort is there. We just, we just end up coming short. And with the Falcons still in the thick of it, I have a message for the Ritter Ruckus coming up later during our hot takes. Plus, a very fun conversation about the Falcons and, yes, their progress as the Falcoholics. Gina Kelly joins us in the nest just ahead. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight. Let's head in the nest with Kelly, Tori, and this week's special guest. Brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. So excited for this In the Nest guest. Gina Kelly is with us here. She is a deputy NFL editor over at SB Nation, a huge Falcons fan. I like to call her the uh, queen of Falcons Twitter. For me, I on Sundays, you were one of my favorite follows. Um, you know, that community has, is, is wild in a lot of ways. Wild, I think, is probably the best adjective to describe it. But what does it mean to be kind of like a part of that community on Sundays that we're all kind of watching this game together and kind of going through these emotions every Sunday? You know, it's been one of the most special things about my time at the Falcoholic. I've been there for 13 years now, and, you know, we've seen a lot of interesting, I think is the nicest way that I could put it, <laughs> thanks to the Falcons over that span. And um, what's stayed consistent throughout that time has been that community. And because this team has had so many ups and downs and the lows are really, really low, uh, it's essentially like a support group. I think that it, it means a lot to the entire community to know that, you know, yes, we are suffering through yet another terrible Falcons blown lead loss, but we are doing it together as a family. And so I think that that's what that's part of what makes it so special. How do you kind of reconcile like being too hard on the team or realizing, hey, this is kind of a little bit of a rebuild going on here. And how do you kind of find yourself towing that line of being too tough, um, but also being fair and not being maybe as much a fan, but also having that fair perspective? Yeah, and I think that the Falcons honestly have helped me with that quite a bit because if you <laughs> asked me this question in 2016 before the Super Bowl loss, my answer might have been very different. Um, I think that that experience kind of forced me to take a step back emotionally and, and to be more analytical political uh, when I look at the team. And yeah, I mean, I, I think just being realistic about it too. Like, I think that a really good example right now is the Mariota versus Ritter conversation. And, um, you know, yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, we've all seen Mariota being inaccurate from week to week. You know, yes, we would love to see what we have in Ritter, but the team really is still in playoff contention. Is it the best idea to throw a rookie out here behind this particular offensive line and take that risk with his health and that sort of thing? So yeah, I, I just think that, you know, thinking more thinking about it more comprehensively and not just like knee-jerk reactions like when I tweet every week I hate this team during the games like <laughs> that's not real analysis but yeah so like if, if I'm actually doing analysis I try to put some more thought into it then I just but, but valid nonetheless <laughs> <laughs> now I, I'm glad that you kind of shifted the conversation to this actual team because that was going to be my next question just what are your overall thoughts on what Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot have done throughout the last year and a half, almost to, to two years now of being in Atlanta. So far, I am sincerely impressed. Um, what Terry Fontenot inherited was a cap disaster, and he has really been able to rework that into a, a huge opportunity for the team in 2023 and beyond. Obviously, uh, I was not thrilled with the way that the whole attempt to trade for Sean Watson went down. Um, I wrote and tweeted extensively about that, so I'm not going to relitigate it. But um, I didn't, I didn't like the fact that the team was essentially forced to trade away Matt Ryan. Then um, I think that they've done the best that they can. I think that. 
that uh, Mario does a really good stopgap. I think that he's a really good leader and a good person for Desmond Ritter to be around while he develops. And I think that with the amount of cap space that they have and the picks that they have in their arsenal, I think that they're poised to actually be competitive next year. Um, you know, like, obviously, they're still in playoff contention, but this team's had, you know, some pretty significant ups and downs. I'm skeptical about how far they could go if they do make it in this year. But next year, I think that there's real potential there. And I think that it's a real testament to the work that Smith and Fontenot have done since they came to Atlanta. That being said, is this team better than you thought they would be this year? And what maybe specifically has surprised you or impressed you? I think that, um, yes, I, I think that we've definitely seen some growth on the defensive side of the ball, uh, which is something that we have always been looking for. It seems like every single year um, <laughs> with this Falcons team. And offensively, I've been genuinely impressed with the run game. Uh, I think that they have de- they've just done a, a phenomenal job of putting everybody on that depth chart in positions to succeed. Uh, Cordero Patterson is my favorite player in the National Football League. Seeing him experience this kind of a career resurgence at this point at his age, for an old lady like me, like it feels really good to see. So, yeah, they they really have pleasantly surprised me. I've been genuinely impressed with the growth that we've seen from this team, and it makes me really excited for the future. Kelly and I talk all the time about when was the last time that we could say that the Falcons were a run first, run heavy offense. Like when it's been well over a day. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think that there was a period of time where it was kind of close to that with Devonte and uh, Tevin Coleman. But really, I think that run first was way back with Michael Turner. I, I, you know, because no matter what, I mean, the passing game was still a huge, huge part of those offenses with Devonte Freeman and uh, and Tevin. So yeah, that's yeah, it's been a very long time. <laughs> You mentioned Ritter a couple times, and I know Tori likes to call the Ritter ruckus on Twitter. Those These people <laughs> who are pining for their favorite player on this team, which is the backup quarterback. Um, I love the Ritter ruckus. Love, love to you guys out there. But, you know, realistically, what do you think they should do there? I think looking at their picture um, and, and being realistic about the fact that I do not expect the Falcons to make a lot of noise in the postseason if they get there. I think that it makes sense because you have to, to give him some playing time because you have to know if this is your guy going forward. And I don't know how you know that unless you actually see him. Well, thank you so much, Gino. We really appreciate your time. Um, anyone who wants to catch the full conversation, make sure you head to fox5atlanta.com. You can find the full thing there. And we'll be right back on Rise Up Tonight. Hey, Atlanta, this is Head Crack talking, and you're watching Rise Up Tonight, presented by AT&T. It's like I don't get caught up in whatever narrative is after four weeks of the daily narratives. You can almost write some of these narratives and live and die every week by the narratives because it sets up bad, you know, narratives. So you can frame the narrative, you can write narratives. So those are easy narratives. And Well, whether Arthur Smith likes our narratives or not, we're going to just keep taking ones where we can get them, right? I like to think that Arthur Smith secretly enjoys our hot takes. Now, we're pretty tame in comparison. but I agree. And I think he's been listening to us. I think he's with me on this one as well. Falcons fans, meet me on camera one. Let's be honest with ourselves. Like it or not, Marcus Mariota is doing just enough. So y'all are not going to be seeing Desmond Ritter anytime soon. And by the way, if you ask Arthur Smith, this is not a hot take. This is what makes the most sense, as we talked about earlier in the show as well. Three of the Falcons next four games are against losing record teams. So there is a legitimate chance they win those games, stay alive, and the NFC South comes down to the season finale against the Bucks on January 8th. And I'm not sure we see Ritter at all this season if that's the case, which is not ideal in my opinion, but I just don't see a scenario where Mariota is able to play where Ritter will be tapping in. Ooh, the Ritter ruckus is not going to like that, <laughs> but nonetheless, it but makes sense. But we run the show, not Yeah, them. exactly. Now, my hot take is less hot take e and just more what actually needs to happen. The Falcons need a decisive win, and I'm not talking about a game they win at the last second. I'm talking about a multi-score win, one that is never close, one that never lets the Steelers stick around. For the Falcons to feel good about going into the bye week next week, my hot take is that is what needs to happen, nothing less. I think we'll all feel good about that. It'll be a lot less stressful as well. <laughs> well, the Falcons head into that bye, and so do we. No rise up tonight next week, but catch us again on December 16th. Staying up late with us tonight. Thank you for doing that. Good night.